Welcome to Outright TV, a video and podcast series bringing you stories of queer people and allies across the globe. I'm Naziha Saeed, the Arabic media coordinator, and for today's episode, I'm talking to Tarek Zidan in Beirut. Tarek, welcome to Outright TV. Hi, Naziha. Hi. Good to see you, Habibi. Good to see you. Uh, Tarek Zidan is the executive director of Helm, a Lebanese LGBTIQ organization recognized to be the first in the MENA region. Tell us more about you, about yourself. Um, well, I mean, uh, what, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, I can tell you a little, little bit about um, why I wanted to uh, sort of do this and why I came back to the region after being away for so long to work with Halim. Um, uh, so, when I was a when I was a kid, uh, around like uh, sixteen years old, I used to live in an area of Beirut that was smack in the middle of one of the uh, red light districts of the city back then. And I used to do a lot of independent work with um, uh, trans sex workers that were that would you know uh, be working on the road between my home and my school where we used to walk. So. It was, I used to, you know, uh, do a lot of, um, you know, stopping by, making sure people have uh, what they needed and whatever on an independent capacity. But I thought that was the only, I was the only person, you know, uh, doing that until I heard of this place called Helen, which was being started by people who at the time were much older than me. And, um, you know, I left Lebanon and uh, 10 years later in 2012, I came back and I, uh, sort of rediscovered this place and discovered how um, special it was. And it was still the only non-commercial community space for queer people in the region at the time, but definitely in Lebanon. And, uh, uh, you know, we were specialists in getting people out of jail and providing protection and all of that. So it's much smaller operation back then. And I never was as scared or as excited of entering a queer space than I was entering Halem the first time not even gay clubs or gay bars or whatever, because it was a completely different energy. And it was an energy I had never ever felt in a queer space anywhere in the world. Because i had been to queer spaces in, in Europe and the US that were you know, advocacy oriented. And I've been obviously to a lot of bars and clubs and restaurants and whatever, but it was special because it was the first time that you had this concentration of people that were um, from the region working on issues affecting queers in the region. And uh, it's addictive, and I never left. And you know, I became the president, and then now the president and the executive director uh, since uh, 2018. And I think it's the best decision I've ever made. Nice. How's the situation in Lebanon these days, especially when it comes to LGBTI community? Really shitty. But I'll give you a better, <laughs> more, <laughs> more <Yeah>. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> deeper, <laughs> more eloquent answer to that. Um, so let me start by saying this, that um, there's a great deal of hope for the community and the movement in Lebanon, largely because um, we really have tangible evidence and proof that we've really uh, reached a critical mass of support within the, within the Lebanese populace itself. And we've won a lot of really hard-won fights uh, especially with the media, especially with civil society, with the private sector, with, with um, so many sort of government institutions. Naziha, you know more than anyone how difficult it is to win fights with the media in the region when it comes to gender and sexuality. So, uh, and the advent of the uh, Lebanese revolution on October 17th was finally uh, 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 created a window for the queer community to, co to come out not in the visibility sense of coming out, you know, in the Western sense, but to come out fully embracing the political identity. Mm -hmm. The Lebanese revolution, if you look at the media coverage of it, might as well have been uh, a queer and more importantly, a, women, a women's revolution. For the first time, it seemed that men were the villains or unnecessary, and it was a <laughs> women and queer driven revolution. And it was wonderful because this, what was happening on the streets, the way queer people reclaimed the streets of Beirut through graffiti, through song, through protest, through visibility, through presence, 
And we as Halim, all we did was set up a tent that says all of us means all of us in Arabic with the other all of us, the second all of us in rainbow, in rainbow colors. And it became the hub for all of the queer individuals in the, in the revolutionary square to come and congregate. People were either chanting or you know, spraying graffiti or, or doing food drives or donating or engaging in the public discussions. It was glorious. And we, it was felt like our debut in society, like a debutante ball, if you wish. But, you know, uh, um, uh, a lot angrier and a lot more righteous. Uh, and then um, COVID came along. And, uh, you know, and the revolution did not come out of a vacuum. It came out of a reaction for the horrible capitalist and patriarchal structures that were oppressing us and whose corruption was leading to quite literally bankrupting the country. Uh, and um, so already we were experiencing an acute political crisis and then an economic meltdown, which I think is, is heading towards hyperinflation uh, and, and a situation very similar to Argentina and at worst, maybe even Venezuela. And, um, and then COVID came. And one of the additional uh, sort of uh, damage that COVID did is wasn't just the fact that it was a pandemic in the middle of an economic recession, in the middle of, an, of a political uh, crisis, was that it forced us to be away from one another. When Helm's model of change is so predicated upon mobilization and building communal power and uh, mobilizing the resources of the queer community to be the agents of its own liberation. Mm -hmm. And it was working. It was working beautifully. And it was working because it was an organic and very much homegrown movement. You, I think you know more than anyone that many of us in the Arab region tried to bring in tactics and strategies and trajectories of LGBT rights movements from the global north. Sometimes things have worked, but largely they haven't. And I think the reason for that is because we operate in, in different systems. And it was very impossible to import it. We couldn't. You had to, you had to earn it. Your own. You know? And, and now we're talking and, and you know, it, uh, uh, so many of our brothers and sisters and siblings have, have, have died recently in the Arab world and have been gone to exile. And, and uh, we're seeing a queer Arab narrative being formed. Very painful one, but one that is also filled with hope and filled with defiance and filled with art and filled with, you know, uh, uh, creation and solidarity. Uh, the death of Sarah Hegazi has blown the entire movement in the region out of its sockets. We're in a completely different era now. But with COVID, we were forced to go home. We were separated from one another and we couldn't be there for one another. And all of a sudden, it was actually, it was really, I mean, it, maybe COVID was a wake-up call, Naziha, because mm -hmm. so much of our work had been so obsessed with political and civil rights. In an area of the world where legislation is nearly impossible, because it's not democratic, yeah. you know, it's, it, and the people in power use us, use our bodies, use our lives as fodder and as scandalous diversion and as and, uh, as a, and view us as a threat constantly. Mm -hmm. So obviously we needed to look a different way. And uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the last thing I will say is that being forced to look at the bare minimum of, of, of what the community was going through during COVID is that we were now looking at social and economic rights and the, de and the development framework as one of the possible trajectories that would work for us in a post-colonial global south. Yeah. Um, I'll can talk about that more, but uh, I feel like you have a lot more questions you want to ask. I mean, uh, just to, to continue uh, talking about that, what did Helm did to the community in such circumstances? So, we, because we have the ad advantage of being in a community center, uh, we have access to data and data in real time. And the first thing that w when we started in the revolution, uh, uh, sort of doing food drives and clothing drives for people who were unable to leave their homes because of the heightened security presence. Don't forget Lebanon hosts 1.5 million Syrian refugees. 
a lot of whom are queer and all of whom uh, rely on the services that Helen provides uh, in terms of services, protection, and many uh, such uh, you know, uh, programs. So we were approximately had 100 people on our list that we would regularly send food items to and you know, uh, household items. Um, as of last month, that list has reached 1,000. Uh, we identified five sort of really um, very uh, 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 urgent needs for the community that have arisen in the COVID, uh, with the COVID and the economic crisis. Obviously, there's a food shortage and there's, uh, we're beginning to see malnutrition in the community, including uh, lack of access to hygiene products and household products. So we've been doing a lot of... Uh, food drives, but the real, our real goal is to create the first ever queer community kitchen, which is what we're working on as a sustainable solution, because you've got two kinds of hunger that are gonna affect the community. There's a caloric hunger and nutritional hunger. With caloric hunger, you can always do, a, you know, supplement it with uh, a carbohydrates and pulses and all of that, but nutritional hunger, meat and vegetables, is not something that you can do in a food drive. You must prepare it for the community. So that's where we really studied. We worked with the World Food Program in order to try to fix that need. Mm -hmm. We're also witnessing uh, an acute uh, shortage of access to healthcare. And I'm not talking about on sexual and reproductive rights. You know, there's a lot of funding for HIV and that's a good thing. But if you ask the community what they really need in terms of health, they, they'll tell you about hypertension. They'll tell you about uh, diabetes. They'll tell you about uh, heart conditions. They'll tell you about not being able to access emergency uh, 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 rooms because of their gender identity. So we need to really think about health, access to healthcare as mm -hmm. one of the sustainable development goals as an avenue for yeah. LGBT rights that is really, really urgent. Um, the third thing is homelessness, eviction. No one can afford rent anymore. And if you're in a country that has capital controls, you can't just create a rent subsidized program because you don't have enough cash to pay people or to pay landlords. And there's no shelter for LGBT people in Lebanon and not even feminist shelters allow trans women in. So we were caught in a place where there was so much, there was no infrastructure and many of the existing existing organizations that do this humanitarian type work have no idea what to do with queer people. You know, and, and they really want to help. Some of them really want to help. They just don't know what to do. Mm. You have, for example, a, a, a gay man who'd come to a government subsidized food delivery uh, uh, sort of service and he'd be turned away because he's not part of a family and they prioritize families. So up, procedurally, uh, from a policy perspective, it's all queer, um, queer exclusive, or mm -hmm. I should say uh, discriminatory. Finally, the last two things I want to say are the two things that people are not talking about. One is domestic violence. Now, we've heard a lot about women uh, um, uh, suffering from this, and the LGBT community is not no exception, except we have much less data because it is so far less reported. Mm -hmm. And people, many of the time, people choose to take the abuse, whether it's in the domestic sphere or in uh, the police station or in the detention center, you name it, then risk being outed and whatever ramifications that might have to their life and their family and their, and, and many people have returned to live with their parents under this economic uh, mm -hmm. meltdown. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the silent killer, the thing that nobody really talks about, which is mental health. Um, the number of individuals that have called, not, not just with Sarah Hadazi's passing, but before, uh, with suicide ideation, with, with really chronic depression has um, skyrocketed. We're talking about like a 40% increase in one or two months. And there's no infrastructure mm -hmm. dealing with this. And so uh, Halim is trying to really plug the holes in all of this. We're dealing a lot with food. We're working on a shelter. Finally, like a really LGBT shelter that is sustainable, that is well-funded, that, that really takes care of people. But that's very difficult. The funding for that is incredibly difficult. And uh, we're also working on labor rights because uh, unemployment is now a thing. Lebanon is approaching 40% unemployment. 
Uh, and you know, vulnerable people are the first to be unemployed or employed in the informal sector and exploited sexually, financially, you name it. So labor rights, uh, shelter, food uh, is what we're working on as a, as a priority. And also trying to mobilize our partners here to work on mental health, because that's not really our, our, our specialty. It's a sad situation, but it makes me at least a little bit, it makes me proud for sure, because that the community is trying to do something for themselves and for, for the whole community. But at the same time, I know how, pressure, how, how much pressure that brings to each one of us and each one of you in, the, in Lebanon. I know it's a lot of negativity. What made you, what makes you worried, Tare? Um, so here's what makes me worried. Um, what makes me worried is that we're entering really uncharted territory because we're so linked to the bigger geopolitical issues that are affecting the region. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that the decision, what, what's happening in Lebanon is not just, you know, an economic meltdown, but there's also a result of many different political decisions that have been taken by world superpowers. The Middle East has long been a place where much bigger regional and global superpower settle scores. And Lebanon is, again, one of those battlegrounds. And unfortunately, it seems that, uh, you know, the most vulnerable of us, uh, whether it's uh, 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 people of, 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 of color or it's uh, LGBT folks or it's women or it's refugees or it's migrant workers, all get, get to bear the brunt of, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that what's happening is going to be a complete destruction of institutions that have been, that have taken decades to build. And I'm not just talking about public and, uh, institutions and private institutions. I'm also talking about constructs that we've built, communities that we've built, uh, mm -hmm. the brain drain that's going to happen, uh, the complete shifting of priorities and of, 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 of culture. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not at all optimistic that, you know, the, the worse the economic situation is, the more people are going to get hungry and rise up in revolution because I know that what's probably going to happen is that people are just going to line up for soup kitchens in longer lines rather than, you know, change, change things from, from the ground up. I'm, not, I'm hopeful and optimistic in the long run because the Lebanese revolution brought to, created a new public secular narrative for the country mm -hmm. outside of the narrative of the religious establishment and of the political establishment who are one and the same. But surviving the next five years is going to be incredibly difficult. And you've got a complete halt on so much progress that has been done. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the security situation really, really scares me. But what uh, uh, scares me the most is that how are we going to, uh, you know, uh, be able to support this entire community, particularly individuals that don't have the privilege of being able to be visible or out or be able to work or be able to have some family support them or somebody from abroad send them remittances. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we going to do when... Uh, you know, uh, the last of the banking sector uh, breaks down because of, of, of the corruption of the banking sector more so than anything else. And we're unable to actually channel whatever what remains of funds in order to serve people. Mm -hmm. uh, already, so many of our greatest talents in the community, whether it's artists or activists or doctors or nurses or people that have been working with Helen for decades, most of the time pro bono because they believe in this cause, they're all leaving. Mm. And the one thing that was incredibly hopeful for me before the revolution was that it was no longer possible for people to find jobs easily outside of Lebanon. The world had changed. Right. And so many of the millennials and Generation X, uh, sorry, Generation Z, found themselves in a country and their only choice was to change it. My generation all left. They all found jobs in Dubai and Paris and New York and whatever. And so they didn't stay and fight. But now hunger is going to drive people away uh, because it, it, it might be too much. Exactly. Especially if there's a, a war or civil conflict. Mm. So 
that's what really scares me. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the next year is going to look like, to be honest. Yeah, that's a, that's a struggle and it's hard to think about it. Well, I want to end up in a positive way. <laughs> Always. Well, it is a social isolation time. Lots mm. of there, people have created their own ways of engaging with the friends and loved ones and even with neighbors sometimes and with the community for sure on social media or do you uh, graphically. Do you have a favorite activity for staying connected while being isolated? <laughs> Did you create your own um, well-being uh, activity during this time? Um, you know, uh, we had to rethink everything that we do because so much of our theory of change and so much of our activities depending on people being in close physical proximity to one another. And, you know, there's really nothing like it, Nizia. There, you... you you lose so much in the communication and in the connection when you're, you're talking to a two-dimensional uh, uh, you know, picture. However, uh, uh, I'm actually looking on the positive side because this pandemic happened at a time where we could reach out to one another due to technology and due to uh, uh, social media and other platforms. And uh, the, what we, the activities that we did was well, first of all, we had this awesome uh, um, campaign called We Shall Pass, Sanabur, which, all, which coincided with the International Day for uh, Trans Visibility. And we decided that, no, we're not going to cancel it. We're going to celebrate it. And uh, what we did was, and if you go to the, to the Facebook page, you'll see, you know, dozens of photos of the community just taking photos of what that day means to them and what they're doing at home. Like people were cooking, people were doing their laundry, people were just sort of chilling on the balcony. And it was a way for people to see each other. You know, without the, without the pandemic, you couldn't have seen each uh, people's lives in their home. Mm. You know, because we all meet in this community center and it's very, you know, structured and there's rules and... You know, there's rules for engagement because, you know, being in a public space is a responsibility. You can't just act like it's your home because it's not. But um, I can't tell you how much it brought people closer. I can't tell you how much, despite the physical distance, people saw each other in a completely new light. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, um, I thought that in the post-COVID era, because people are so afraid from a second wave, we're going to have to rebuild our volunteer base from scratch. It doubled. Wow. And, uh, you know, we have the masks and we've got the Purell and we're ready. But um, that's, what really, that's what really gave me hope because I was going back to work with uh, 10 tons on my shoulders thinking how are we going to rebuild all of the trust and the, and, and the camaraderie and, 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 and this group of people that was like 180 people were Helm's members, you know, uh, were coming regularly. And, uh, you know, uh, and how are we going to bring them all back? And they were there waiting. So um, somehow we were still connected. You know, incidents like what happened with Sarah connect us. And incidents like, uh, you know, a Masha Leila concert connect us. And, you know, it, through pain and through celebration is how we build power and we build community. Right. And uh, I think we're on our way. What are you looking for after all of this finished? Um, you mean COVID or you mean... Yeah, COVID um, and situation get better, hopefully. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to reconnecting with you <laughs> and with all of our awesome family members who are not in the region and who make it possible for us to be able to continue and do this difficult work because you do exactly half of the difficult work yourselves. Um, but what I'm really looking forward to is um, the fact that COVID changed everything globally and SADA changed everything for the community. And the lessons that have emerged are, I think, monumental for the movement in the MENA region. I think 
uh, you know, we're a human rights organization, we're not a humanitarian organization, but doing humanitarian relief work has opened our eyes to so much strategic possibilities in using mm. uh, uh, development and in using social and economic rights for sustainable long-term civil and political rights. And I am so excited because finally things make sense. And they don't just make sense theoretically or in diatribes and debates on social media. They made sense programmatically. We saw it translate. We saw power being built in our eyes, in our own communities, in our region. And that's a narrative that I can't wait to co-author with everybody here and with you and all of the other folks that work on this, on this, um, on this uh, uh, very, very, you know, vital and important cause for all of us. So um, I'm actually excited. I just don't know when when we can start because everything is so up in the air but it'll come i'm sure it'll come we're gonna win yeah Tariq, thank you so so much for this very very interesting uh interview and for your time <laughs> to speak with uh, outright tv today my pleasure thank you habibi thank you this was naziha saeed and i spoke to Tariq zaidan fr from beirut uh, my colleagues and i will be coming soon with more stories. Thank you.